Welcome to The Creator's Adventure, where we interview creators from around the world hearing their stories about growing a business. Have you ever wondered who's coached people like Tony Robbins, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Angelina Jolie, Sean Connery, Sylvester Stallone, and more? Well, today's guest is the answer. It's Arthur Samuel Joseph. I'm excited to talk with Arthur today to share his wisdom with you, as well as learn how I can become a better communicator myself. Hey everyone, I'm Brian McAnulty, the founder of Heights Platform. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, we're here today with Arthur Samuel Joseph. He is the founder and chairman of the Vocal Awareness Institute. Arthur Samuel Joseph is widely recognized as one of the world's foremost communication strategists and authorities on the human voice. Throughout the course of his career as a communication coach, his students have ranged from Academy Award winners such as Sean Connery, Angelina Jolie, to Hollywood stars including Sylvester Stallone, Pierce Brosnan, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arthur, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's sweet to hear those names recast. How are you, Brian? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you? I'm wonderful. It, it looks beautiful where you're, uh, where you're sitting. In my backyard, outside. yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I like to spend time uh, outside on, on calls and things as well um, here in Austin. But uh, our, our winter was pretty pretty rough this year, the past couple of years, actually that uh it's gotten a lot colder than it uh it should have been it's been pouring right, so. cats and dogs here as you know but not today mm. <laughs> well, that's good it's nice today so my first question for you is what would you say is the biggest thing that either you did or you are doing that's helped you to achieve the freedom to do what you enjoy be a profound listener trust and take action awesome very very clear and succinct i like that and i can amplify i can do as i said before we got on this as your sandbox and uh, i didn't know the questions and so show me i'm a storyteller and i teach communication so however you want it to be conveyed you just let me know brian sure no no i like that so can you tell me a little bit of the background, how you developed your vocal awareness program? What what inspired you to create that? Um, and also, if you can share more of your journey of how you became really uh, the world's foremost communication tra- strategist. And, uh, That's artist. really interesting. That's a thoughtful question. Thank you. I turned 77 in January of this year, and it began my 59th year of teaching. And... My journey began before that when I was four and my mother dragged me into an accordion studio and I was metamorphosed. Unfortunately, not into a cockroach like Greg Osamsa in Kafka's Metamorphosis, but into music. And I'm sure I've dramatized it over the years, but I was morphed and I knew at four that music was my life. In the sixth grade, I auditioned for choir. I couldn't sing America the Beautiful on pitch and they wouldn't let me in the choir. Junior high in the seventh grade, I auditioned for choir and Mrs. Grill let me in her high tones. And I knew at 12 that music was my life. That singing was the direction music was going to take me. At 15, I met my first voice teacher, Mrs. Julia Kinsel. Mrs. Kinsel was about my age, maybe a few years younger, younger, early 70s, and I'm 15. In the middle of my lessons, Brian, I'm not exaggerating this. I would actually behave like this. I would say, stop. No, I don't want to do it like that. I hear it this way. Manically clamping my hands to my ears like that. And she allowed this bizarre behavior from some snotty-nosed 15-year-old kid. Because she knew something about me I didn't yet know. That I hear vocal sound unlike any other human being I've ever met on the planet. When I hear a voice, I hear you. It's a perfect imprint. And as voice teachers, we're all dogmatic. We teach this mystical art form. I see your acts behind you sitting in the back corner, and I can see you put your hand on the B, play B flat. But how do you find B flat here? And so we're, we're imbued with this mystical, magical ability. So as teachers, we're con- commun- we communicate as though we're omniscient. And we don't get questioned because we're teaching magic. And... But her lack of dogma allowed me to create new form. And vocal awareness, it's an overused phrase, but it is actually a paradigm shift in 
in voice, not just communication. Speech is habit. You, did you ever take singing lessons or do you sing with your music, Brian? A little bit. I don't enjoy it as much as guitar, but yeah. But you I, know, I, when you, I was in the choir in high school and things like and that. And you yeah. would do scales like you're doing 10 sets of jumping jacks, yeah, 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 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But in our work, it's ballet, it's bar work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's line, there's pressure flow, there's symmetry, there's beauty. It's very different. It's not just jumping jacks. We apply the same principles to everything. I say about singing, the act of singing is natural. The art of singing is skill. I've literally taught deaf people to sing. So we can all sing. There's no such thing as tone deaf. But to get back to the other, I began teaching at 18. And my work vocal awareness was fully, fully canonized by my early 20s. And God knew I could not take this journey alone, to be frank. I was hadn't earned my after and equity cards when I was 17 or 18 doing summer stock and TV. And but I didn't have the courage to really go out and teach vocal awareness full time. And finally, by the time I was 25, I've been performing and teaching part time, et cetera. But, and I had a regular job that I got fired from. And so God was saying to me, well, if you don't have enough courage to do this, Arthur, I'm going to get you, going to get you fired and make you have to do it. So in our first home decades ago, we had one child at the time, and we have more now. And I'm sitting in the living room, and my bride is sitting in the back in the back with our toddler. And I'm sitting by the fireplace, and I'm saying that my bride is only emotionally supportive, excuse me, intellectually supportive of me doing vocal awareness full time. She, that was a lie. I knew I was lying as I said it. She, I was scapegoating her. She was there for me a thousand percent but I wasn't there for myself. And so that was an epiphanal moment. And I came to, the next day I put an ad in the Cal State Northridge newspaper, the Matador, because it was free, offering one free introductory lesson. And I got a student, it became like family to us. She studied with me for a long time, and all that kind of stuff. And I said at the outset, I listened deeply I trust and I take action. This was that moment. My responsibility is not to you, the client, to you, the student. It's to, as I see it, God in the work, the capital W work, the big work. I learned that that day. My re I don't allow my clients, myself, to be the corks in our own bottle. Mm. There's In one of my books, I've written five books, and there's a wonderful quote from the one profound choreographer to the other from the 20th century, Martha Graham to Agnes de Mille. Martha Graham created modern dance. And she said to Agnes de Mille in the letter, there's only one of you in all time. And if you block it, the world will not have it. So I teach people empowerment through voice. I taught Tony Robbins many years ago, and I still, last couple of years, have taught his trainers and Taught it is at like 1,600 people over the last couple of years and virtual in his leadership academy. And I would say what I said to Tony in the first meeting, I would say, Tony, you cannot empower people. That's arrogant. But you can help them empower themselves. Mm -hmm. That's this work, empowerment through voice. And you mentioned some high-profile Hollywood stars, but this year, my 29th student is going to be inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. My fourth or fifth NBA star is going to be inter inducted in the Pro Basketball Hall of Fame and others. But I've taught Holocaust survivors. I've taught deaf people to sing. I have taught children as young as nine months and people as into their 90s. I teach the art of surrender. That's in a really important word. Surrender, serve, and soar. 
we all have our dreams. We all even taught a woman years ago for many years. She used to identify herself as America's dream coach. And I did a seminar for her many years ago in San Francisco. And I began the seminar by telling a hundred or so people in the audience, I don't believe in dreams. I don't believe in dreaming. We all dream. But I created a character in my first book many years ago, The Sound of the Soul, that I call the pragmatic visionary. Because all the dreamer does is dreams. But mm. the pragmatic visionary works to make the dream a reality. That's this work. So sociologists, as you may know, Brian, tell us what the greatest uh, what the greatest for society is. It's public speaking. You've heard that before, I'm sure. Uh, that's bogus, but that's what we're told. The greatest are actually two fears. Fear of abandonment and ownership of my power. How often is it terrifying to claim who I am and not worry about what you think of me being me? So when I surrender, which means to yield or to give back, I serve my vision for my life. I serve, we create and vocal awareness a persona statement, my brand, what is my identity? I look at the Heights website and I look at your font and your color palette and all of those things. You chose all of that and you spend a lot of money on developing that. We all do. But then we get in front of the camera, get on the microphone, we talk like this. We don't represent what all that says. Ooh, you know. And so all of a sudden, all of that is dissipated. So how do we embody our brand? If I say to you, I'm very, I'm very grateful, Brian, that you haven't, you, I haven't come up for air yet. And I'm so glad that you give me the sandbox to play and thank you so much. <laughs> now that's bogus, but you don't know why that feels disingenuous until I say, I'm really grateful for the time you're giving me today. Thank you for letting me share with you. Brian. Now the words may have changed, but the intent was fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. You didn't realize the first time my pitch was too high, I spoke too fast, and my eyes were disengaged. All you got is that man's untrustworthy. Second time you didn't know I breathed, my pitch went lower, I slowed down, and I used my eyes to communicate. All you got is I trust that man. Wow, uh, yeah. And so, Interesting. And, and so I teach all these fundamentals. I say to an athlete in the first lesson, somebody literally taught you every single thing you do. But think about it, Brian, who teaches us to be ourselves while others watch? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I want to no I want to exactly. So I want to interject here and okay. mention interject that, away because I'm sorry for going on so long. No, but you no, it was perfect. The passion in, in me. It was perfect. Yeah, it's a very enjoyable to listen to. So in our, our interview intake form, uh, what you wrote was uh, in capital letters, embody who you truly are never presenting yourself, rather learning how to be yourself in full conscious awareness. And I think that there's a lot of people listening to this or watching this that would agree with the idea of just being yourself, not not trying to be anybody else or, or please please anyone specific and just really being truly yourself. And I agree with that too. I think that th this is the way to be, right? Okay. Thanks. Say being truly yourself again, but this time see your and self as two separate words and see the second and see self with a capital S being truly yourself. You were saying yourself is one word. Mm -hmm. Say it as two words and the second word begins with a capital S about being your uh, truly, truly yourself. Hear the difference? Yeah. yeah. Because that's the seventh ritual of vocal awareness is to be myself. Mm -hmm. Three words, not two. And it doesn't say present for whose approval. Mm -hmm. But please go on. I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, so no, that was great. Um, yeah, I'm I'm excited to learn from you here. Um, because can you I'm tell me at, that was great again and underline the word great and see a period at the end of the sentence? That was great. No, you didn't underline the word and you didn't see a period. How do I see the period? What do you what do you mean? More Actually, more conscious stop? Yes, just see a dot. That was great. 
Now you're still questioning because you're trying to figure out what this crazy old person is saying here. <laughs> and just say those three words definitively and end the story. That was great. Hear the difference? The inflection yeah. went down at the end. Yep. More authoritative. And the word sounds like it really means something. Yeah, yeah. Just by seeing punctuation. That's really Please interesting. Yeah. I, I, I've never thought of it that way. Um, I know. I, I think, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, definitely. I, I think this will help me as a, as a host because um, podcasting, interviewing, that's not, that's not the main thing that I do. Um, and I realize there's a lot of ways I could get better at it. Um, so what, what better person to be speaking with? Right <laughs> now? Um, so what I'm getting at is the idea that so many would agree with, okay, I, I want to be myself right? And there, there's difficulty in that. So I agree with that too. I, I want to be myself. Um, I feel like I, I even would go as far as to preach it to others in some way. But I think it's something that so many people struggle with, even if they think or agree with the concept itself, um, how they can feel comfortable or confident in doing that. So what advice would you have for, for me or for anyone who feels that way? Wonderful question. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm very good with language, but I don't want people to be seduced by my words. I love people to, if they're interested, go to my website and look at my TEDx talk. Go to my website and there's one of my students who's going to be inducted in the Pro, Foot, Pro Basketball Hall of Fame this year. Is a great player by the name of Dwayne Wade. And took a look at his retirement speech from 2020. We've been together four months at that time. And take a look at Dwayne Wade a year earlier. It's a fundamentally different human being. And the goal is never to make you into someone you're not, but to help bring out what's possible. If anybody watches this, if you watch this, it's the first time Dwayne ever read prepared remarks. First time you ever read teleprompter. First time you ever, and we didn't even get a dress rehearsal on the prompter. When he walks out on the court that night in front of 18,000 people, there was no rehearsal. But we'd been prepping it. And I write all my speeches with my team. And then they're all annotated in a trademark piece of this work called visceral language, conveying the emotion of words. I'm a singer. I look at music and it tells me everything to do. Mm. You look at words, they're just words. They don't tell us diddly. And so I bring these words alive. For example, when you said great, and I had you underline it and saw a period, it actually meant something. If I say, you're, I'm going to say this twice, you're a really lovely man, Brian, thank you. Versus, you're a really lovely man, Brian, thank you. First one, my eyes were dead. Second time, all I did was open my eyes, but it felt more genuine. Yeah. And right now, if I say, this is my life's work, and thank you for allowing me to share it, let me do that differently. This is my life's work. Thank you for allowing me to share it. Versus, this is my life's work. Thank you for allowing me to share it. First time, I didn't breathe. Second time, all I did was inhale. Mm hmm so going back to the example of the athlete who's been taught every single thing, nobody teaches us any of the things I just shared with you, for example. And how many life coaches have I taught who had trouble coaching their own lives because of these fundamental issues that we haven't dealt with? So in vocal awareness, we have seven rituals. Watch what your body does. And you gave me permission to play with you a little bit. Sit up straight. Sit at attention, please, Brian. And notice how you hold your breath. Mm. Yeah, I did. That's what happens when we present ourselves. What are you thinking of me? How am I doing? Now, in this time, I don't want you doing that ever again. Instead, I'm going to guide it so you don't have to do it. But with me, we're going to pull this golden thread 
helping you embody a magnificent man of stature, feeling extraordinary about who you are, Brian. You ready? Mm -hmm. And please, everybody, join us. Embody a man of stature, a woman of stature, a person of stature, feeling extraordinary, taller and taller and taller. Do you notice you've already inhaled, Brian? Mm -hmm. And now, within yourself, not aloud, take in the thought, it's the first of our seven rituals, of saying thank you to God, thank you to Source, to the Goddess, thank you. Just whatever you want to embody that truth for yourself, just really embrace it for just a moment, please. Did you inhale? Mm -hmm. Is your space quieter? Yep, feels like it. No, take a nice deep top of the morning breath, Brian. It's great to be alive. And exhale. Now this time, and this will be the last thing I'll make you do. Allow, don't take, allow a slow, silent, loving breath it'll take five to seven seconds and i'll guide you tell me when you're ready okay slowly and lovingly deeper 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 and exhale you see that breath is fundamentally different mm -hmm. And it introduces the truth that a breath is not only physical, but it's also spiritual and emotional. The root of the word spirit, spiritus, means to breathe. The Hebrew word neshama means both soul and breath. I teach communication mastery. And mastery in any discipline is only achieved when we integrate mind, body, spirit. That athlete in whatever sport before they compete has rituals. And they all have a spiritual component. That performer off stage waiting to come out isn't just chatting with the stage manager or their agent. They're focused. They're in prayer. They're preparing to walk out. But do we apply that in life before that Zoom meeting or before we go on a date and want to have a great time being ourselves? Of course we don't. So I teach these seven rituals and we embed them in everything we do. A breath isn't just a breath. It's physical, emotional, spiritual. Yeah, you know, that's so interesting because I'm, I'm thinking back to some experiences I've had and going May back I play to... with you again? Sure, sure. Keep your eyes on me while you say this and, no say, and don't say ums anymore. Okay. Just keep your eyes on me, please. So... I'm thinking back to these experiences that I had when I was a musician in high school, I was in a band and I had no trouble at all to perform in front of a live audience. It, it felt natural to me. It felt like something I wanted to do. I didn't feel um, nervous, embarrassed, anything like that. But the idea of singing in front of my choir teacher was completely different. And I felt completely nervous, uh, judged, concerned, and I wasn't able to perform in the same way. And I think that in a way, it's similar to what you're describing, that when I'm performing in front of the stage doing the music, it's something that I can just go feel natural. I have these rituals, as you're saying, but performing in front of the, the choir teacher or or like all these other things you say, getting on a Zoom meeting or whatever, there is no ritual for it. Just like the basketball player, the football player has the ritual for their sport that they're they're dedicated at. They don't have that for communication. And did you notice why you stayed with me that the resonance and pitch of your voice changed, mm -hmm. your pace changed, and you started listening very subtly to yourself a little bit, correct? Mm -hmm. You were hearing. You weren't editing. You were monitoring. That's the beginnings of what I call conscious awareness and the beginnings of no longer feeling self-conscious as you did in front of your choir teacher, but becoming conscious of self with a capital S. Claiming 
And so we look up the word hubris and we know it means extreme arrogance, blaspheming the gods. That great artist on stage is totally hubristic. That great athlete in competition is completely hubristic. They don't hope their teammates or their coach approves. They're in their skill set. The moment that artist leaves the stage, the athlete leaves the field, court, they're just normal again. But in vocal awareness, there is no off switch. And for me, hubris, as it is for that artist or that athlete, is positive, it is not arrogant. As infants, as toddlers, we are totally hubristic. Our parents are only in our lives to serve our, their, serve our needs. It's the world according to us. Everything revolves around us. That's called egoism, not egotism, where I am the center of my universe. Out here, we get all these mixed messages. Oh, don't act like that. Well, what people think, Brian? Oh, you shouldn't say that. Like my teacher said, I couldn't be in the choir in the sixth grade because I couldn't sing in tune. Just mouth the words. So if, what do people think? You sound arrogant, whatever. So if I say to you, Brian, vocal awareness is extraordinary work. It can help you change your life in moments. Now that's stupid and arrogant. But if I say, Brian, vocal awareness is extraordinary work. It can help you change your life in moments. That's not arrogant. That's my truth. So we learn to embody not just the message, but the messenger. The root of that word persona that I mentioned, the persona statement, literally means through the sound. Yeah, and identity when you is, said that, I could yeah. feel the sincerity in your voice compared to the first time where you're just oh, telling thank me something. You. Yes, yes, thank you. So am I making pragmatic sense, not just intellectual sense? As I prattle on here, am I... Yeah. For being helpful. Yes, definitely. Um, I've got I've got two questions I want to get to. I want to make sure I cover. Uh, one is a selfish one that I've just thought of that um, I'm curious for myself. And another is one that I think will be very useful to our audience. But I hope this first one will be useful as well. So the first question is that um, I'm not sure if this is an excuse that I'm I'm making of something I'm believing or not, or if it's really something that's that's true and something that can can be affected by the way that that I act or communicate. But I tend to feel that with, with talking online to people, and as a musician, I'm sure you understand, not only as a, a vocal coach, but there is the, the, the delay that we have to deal with, talking with people around the world and the latency o over the internet. And I feel that there's times when I'm communicating with people that I have to I know I can definitely get better at removing ums and 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 buts or things like that, but I I feel that there's a moment that I have to continue talking and rather than adding silence because of that delay, if I if I add some kind of silence or or am more careful in the way I'm communicating, that the person talking with me may, may not think that I'm done. They may start talking over me. Is there what what advice do you have for me regarding that? I guess. One, I don't know that I agree, but you have more experience in that realm than I do. You speak for me a tad quickly, mm -hmm. which then eliminates space. A song without a rest is not the same piece of music. Space has value. And in communication, it creates thinking time, it creates listening time, it creates connect activity in my conversations as a teacher and you as a host you can am i do you understand how yeah. does that feel i'm always engaging to make sure that you're still awake over there and <laughs> i'm not just speaking to your intellect but you really understand that space i intentionally created right there did you wonder why did that man take so long? Did he go out for a ham and cheese? Where did he go, man? No, you accept it as my communication style. So you and think that if I just start to adopt this I, slower, more intentional style, it's not, that I don't think I know, that it, I, I know that it would be. 
because it's also claiming your sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And this is whose name's on the door. You created this company. This is your show, dot, 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 dot. And because you're such a gracious man and you create this platform, quote unquote, for us, you're in here to serve everybody. And the more empowered you feel, the more we all gain. Mm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Definitely. I have a wonderful exercise where I have somebody time and read. I read the same thing four times. The first time, look at these split like this, talking like this. Another time, talking like this. And, also. and then another time, sort of okay, but a little too fast. And the last time, speaking more the way it should be delivered. Like that. Mm -hmm. And the last three are invariably all the same time. And it introduces the understanding that speed is only speed in communication. It is never how fast, only how effective. And that we also have a finite amount of time and space in that 20 seconds or two minutes. It's how I use the energy in that time and space. I can talk to you like this until the cows come home and you would have hung up on me an hour ago. Or I can speak with you more dynamically and have that giant chasm of a space in the middle of that without you questioning. Why is that space so big? Because you're trusting me, I'm engaging you. And the eye contact is a huge piece. So I, I know we have our questions here and but the relationship is here and all of that. Was that helpful at all? Definitely, definitely. And if not, even just to, to hear the idea and to know that to, to hear this from you alone is is a helpful thing rather than to to just read it somewhere or, or have it. No, I got it, yes. Yeah. And I teach, you know, in this regard, I know you have another question. My work is all metaphor. Yes, it's impeccable technique. Impeccable technique. But the metaphor is that every single thing in life, Brian, revolves around only two things. To choose to do something or choose not to. It doesn't matter how scary, how difficult. All that matters is how badly. When you were learning to play that axe behind you, if you didn't like the, the pain in your fingertips, then you're not going to be able to play until you get those calluses. And so you had to withstand that because you wanted to play that and the hours and hours and hours of practice until you were good enough to get in front of it. That was discipline. That was a choice. But these more personal choices we all make every day are far more daunting because we're just human beings. Speech is habit. Nobody thinks about these things that I think about all the time. We just babble. But I'm teaching mastery. So I want us to make the choice to shift the switch, claim our sovereignty claim our ability to feel empowered not present but be and listen you ask me and it's for the sixth ritual this deeper listening staying attuned when you were speaking and you started to monitor that's the beginnings of not just consciousness or awareness but in vocal awareness what's called conscious awareness really tuning in intra interpersonally when you're playing that and there's a crowd, you may be in the fourth measure, but you're anticipating the seventh or eighth if it's a difficult measure at the same time because you're all in technique. And you've been trained, you trained yourself to do that. If your right shoulder's getting a little tight, you know to loosen it. But we don't know this stuff out here. We can sit around like that and we don't know, oh, you need to sit differently. I didn't even think about that. So do you see how similar it all is? Yeah, definitely. You had another question. Yeah. So I think that creators nowadays, everybody has to in some way get the attention of their audience, right? So I want to hear your thoughts on what stories storytelling skills play in communication mastery. And what do you do to go about teaching those skills to your clients? Storytelling skills, storytelling skills are incredibly important. And I embed pictures. If I say to you, on my website, there's a sweet story, a parable I created years ago 
called Voice of the Monkey Boy. And it talk about Matsugoru wanting to climb the tall one in his village. And talk about how intimidating it was. And for years, all it did was intimidate him until one day he decided, this is the day I'm going to climb the tall one. And he touches the bark of the tree and how rough it is and how he's a little scared. But now as he puts his hand on that branch and feels the energy well within him as he pulls himself up, now he's gaining greater confidence and on and on. My point is I'm giving you pictures. So I see these images in my mind's eye and you see them in yours consequently. So storytelling has to have a map. It has to have pictures. You can't just say I went to the grocery store. How did you get to the grocery store? Well, I got in the car and blah, blah, blah. So we create pictures. We practice, 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 practice. If anybody watches my TEDx talk, I've probably only written out two or three talks in my entire almost 60 years of teaching. That was one of them because I like to call myself the Winton Marsalis of communication. I like to riff because I have the technique and it's my challenge to myself to be in the work. And mm. Winton Marsalis, for those who don't know, is a great jazz trumpeter and great classical trumpeter, great tone player, best in the world, likely. Anyway, so that talk I wrote out, even the day of the talk, I was practicing at 25 to 30 times. Wow. Got to the venue with my bride two and a half hours ahead of everyone, went off in an ante room with my recorder and went all over it again, studying my game film, listening. But when I walk out, all you see is Arthur being Arthur. Not knowing how much work it took for me just to be Arthur. So we don't realize how much work it takes to be ourselves. That's where I began while others watch. So we can, we write out our story, we write out our PowerPoint slides, we practice them and practice them on the mirror, on video, on audio. Before you walk out in front of people to play When Sunny Gets Blue, you know that thing inside and out. And the way you played it on Tuesday is different than when it sounds on Wednesday. Every day is different, but you've mastered the piece. But we don't think about that when it comes to speaking telling our story yeah I, I i can tell you that i truly didn't even as a musician myself i'm i'm now inspired not only to be better at this because i, I want to be better for my own business and everything but just i i feel like i'm gaining interest in the skill of of doing it just from oh, cool. hearing you talk about it oh that's great yeah definitely all right so that, that's awesome i've got one more question before we get going and on the show, we like to have each of our guests ask a question to the audience. So if you can think of anything that you want to ask the audience, it could be something that you're curious about. It could be something that's more of an introspective question you want to get everybody thinking about. What would that be? What I'd like you to think about, what is your greatest desire? What is the vision that you have for yourself? And what prevents you, if anything, from achieving it? If there is something that prevents you from achieving it, do you want it badly enough to achieve it regardless? Every single thing in life costs something. Think about which price you want to pay. The one for achieving it or the one for giving it? That's great. That's a really important question, I think. I think that's something that entrepreneurs undoubtedly have to, to struggle with and realize if they want to be able to move forward with their goal. I Two years ago, one of my NFL Hall of Fame inductees, in this speech we wrote when he was 20 or 21 and he was drafted, on the front of the notebook he carried with him throughout each season, 2021, he said, I want to be in the Hall of Fame. 25 years later, he was in the Hall of Fame, but he kept that alive every year. Emmett Smith, the all-time leading rusher in the NFL, 
in the Hall of Fame speech we wrote. He's 20 years old. He's going to bed one night. He hasn't run one down. And he wrote his, his first goal to become the all-time leading rusher. He didn't say great running back. So when he identified that was his vision, then he had to create a plan. The plan was health because he knew he would require longevity to achieve that. Probably only missed six or eight games in 16 or 18 years of playing in the NFL. And so we establish it, then we set the path for achieving it. Awesome. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Before we get going, where else can people find you online? My email, excuse me, my website is vocalawareness.com. And if everybody wants to write to me, they can write to support at vocalawareness.com. And I'm beginning a new online series May 2nd for people from, they come in, got a client, student in one from Australia, New Zealand, Ireland. They come from all over the world. And no matter what the time zone, it's 9 a.m. here in L.A. And it was midnight in, in Australia and 6 a.m. in New Zealand. So that's coming up. I'm going to be doing a seminar in London the end of May. And I'm just here to help make a difference. And I want to change the world through voice. That's my vision. So if anybody out there wants to help me do that, please join my human achievement movement and help me achieve that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Arthur. Brian, it's been such a pleasure. You're a gracious man. Thank you for today, please. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Awesome. I think we're all set then. Um, my was this okay gonna, for you, Brian? This was great. Yeah, this was excellent. I, I really feel uh, I'm, I'm, I'm truthfully saying that I really do feel inspired um, by uh, what I'm hearing from you here today. So thank you. And uh, I will, I'll let you get going now because I know you have to, uh, to get going, but my team will reach out when we have the schedule ready for this. And again, if I can continue you personally, or if you want to do this again, or you want to talk about any way I can help you, it's not about my business, it's about how I can contribute to you. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks Thank for you. working this day. out for me so we can make it happen. Yeah, of course. All right, I'll see you. Bye-bye.